The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? Well, the Lord be with you. An awful lot of Anglicans in here today. <laughs> I was just trying to flush out a few of you, but there's a lot of you. Oh, well. Don't you, just, uh, don't you just yearn for the day when workplace ministry will just be a natural part of church life? Thelma is 93 years old, and she's not quite as fleet of foot as uh, she was when she was 89. <laughs> She's part of a small Baptist church in England. Uh, she does a few things in the church. She loves the church, but she really doesn't think she's got a mission field anymore. Then her pastor takes her through a DVD called Life on the Front Line. And suddenly, Thelma realizes something. She does have a mission field. She does have a front line, a context where she naturally meets people in her everyday life that she can get to know and bless. She had one all along. She just couldn't see it. In her case, it was the little convenience store run by an Asian family down the bottom of her road. And so it is throughout the winter, come rain, come shine, come sleet, come snow, despite her friends pleading with her, Thelma, Thelma, please, please let us do your shopping for you. Thelma makes her way to the people that the Lord has given her to minister and bless them. And she's exhilarated to still be part of God's purposes in time and eternity. Don't we all want to be Thelmas? When we're 93, then we all want to be Thelma's now. Why am I telling you a story about a 93-year-old retiree at a workplace conference? Well, because when that pastor, when that pastor helped Thelma see that she had a front line, well, that pastor helped everyone else in her congregation see that they had a front line. Stay-at-home mums, stay-at-home dads, unemployed people, retirees, student high school kids, workers, everyone. And when everyone realizes that they have a place in their everyday Monday to Saturday lives where they can go and minister for God, then so do the workers. Now over the last three years, we at the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity have probably seen five times more people engaging in workplace ministry than we saw in the whole of the previous decade. And not just engaged, but praying, learning, reflecting, encouraging one another in church-based home groups. Five times as many. Now this hasn't been because there's been a sudden upsurge in uh, worker breakfasts, or a sudden upsurge in mega conferences on work, or a sudden upsurge in adult Sunday school classes on work, or a sudden upsurge in book sales, though that would have been nice. <laughs> it's because we and the partner, pioneer pastors we've been working with have realized something. As an old nugget of American wisdom goes, you can't get there from here. You can't get there from here. The root issue facing the workplace movement isn't really about work at all. Back in 2010 at the Lausanne Congress for World Evangelization, many of you were there, I asked delegates there this question. Is this the mission strategy in your nation? To recruit the people of God to give up some of their leisure time to support the mission initiatives of church paid workers, to recruit the people of God to give up some of their leisure time 
to support the mission initiatives of church paid workers. And as those of you who are there will recall, pretty much everyone in that room from all around the world put up their hands and said, that's what we've got. Now that strategy is fruitful, but it is incomplete. And what it means is that globally 98% of Christians, those who aren't in ordained work, 98% of Christians are not empowered and envisioned for 95% of the time that they are awake. To put it another way, most Christians are only empowered for mission in 5% of their waking lives. What a waste. What an opportunity. Imagine if they were. So the root issue here is not that churches are not equipping uh, workers for workplace engagement. The root issue is, is that churches are not equipping Christians to be disciples, whole life disciples, in the places that they spend their time Monday through Saturday, wherever that is. And so we will not release all the workers into fruitful mission unless we create whole life disciple making churches. Now we all know that we, we, if we don't find a way, if we don't find a way to engage the local church, the workplace movement may help some people, but we won't help most people. We may help some workers, but we won't help most workers. We may reach professionals and business people, and we do, but we will not also reach construction workers and secretaries and mechanics and teachers and clerks. We won't also reach fishermen and carpenters. So the challenge that we have is not about modifying, tinkering with the church's teaching curriculum. It's about fundamentally changing the whole church's culture into a whole life disciple making culture. Because once a church has a vision to disciple all her people to be fruitful wherever they are during their Monday to Saturday lives, then the workers in that church will naturally be envisioned and discipled and see their work as a context for fruitfulness. Seek first to make whole life disciples and all these workers will be added unto you. <laughs> Can it happen? Can it happen in small and medium-sized churches as well as in big city churches? Well, it is happening. Over the last decade, we've been partnering with pastors and their lay leaders to find simple ways to change the core culture of local churches. And I commend to you the very good endeavours of uh, my London Institute colleagues on the Imagine Church Project and our partners in the US at the Veer Institute. Now, as many of you know, changing a culture of an organisation is complex. It's not about programmes, it is about perspective. And ultimately, either a church really wants to help people in their Monday to Saturday lives, or they don't. And if they do, it doesn't cost money. You don't need to hire any staff. It just requires a curiosity to ask people about what's really going on out there, to have lunch, to have a conversation. One of the best things you could do is just to invite a pastor into your workplace and show him around and have a cup of coffee. And one of the best things you can do if, you, you know, if you're a pastor is to get yourself invited. <laughs> Krispy Kreme donuts or whatever. And out of that conversation, that ongoing dialogue and understanding between pastors and people come all those little ideas that begin to change the direction of a local church one degree at a time. Everyone, pastors and people, need to ask a simple question. How do our few hours together help us to be fruitful for Christ in the many hours that we're apart? Now this sounds simple, and frankly it is simple, to begin. <laughs> but it is very hard to sustain because culture is tough, tough to change. I just want to highlight for today one change that we've found that helps, and it is creating a shared language for everyday mission. As we saw with Thelma, not everyone has a workplace, but everyone has a front line. One person's his little league, another person's Weight Watchers, one person's the boardroom, another person's the factory. Isn't that great? No one gets left out. And when no one gets left out, that warms a pastor's heart, doesn't it? Frontline becomes shorthand in prayer, in conversation, in teaching for everyday mission. Everyone gets to play. 
And when everyone gets to play, that thrills a pastor's heart. So for example, if you offer a home group resource on work, well, unless you're in a large metropolitan church, maybe 15% of the groups in the church will do it. But you offer a group resource on frontline ministry, well, every group in the church can do it. And here's the thing, 90% of the material is applicable to the workplace. Now, the other grand breakthrough we had in language came when we realized that most workers really don't believe that they're very fruitful for Christ at all. Shona was 34 years old and a school principal uh, in Glasgow, and she'd already turned around two failing schools in this hugely deprived section of East Glasgow. And she didn't think she'd done anything for Jesus. Turning around two failing schools is a tremendous achievement for any executive leader. So why didn't she think she'd done anything to God? How could it actually be that she didn't think that giving hundreds of children a better education, a future and a hope, giving their parents and guardians a future and a hope, building the morale of these communities that were so depressed and demoralized, how could she possibly think that God wasn't interested in that? Well, she thought it because like most lay Christians, she believed that the only thing that really matters to God is evangelistic conversations and direct social action for the poor. And that's not what she was doing. So we realized that we need to give people a richer framework for fruitfulness. So we came up with six M's, M&M, 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 a lot of M&M's. Modeling godly character, making good work, ministering, grace and love, molding culture, being a mouthpiece for truth and justice, and a messenger for gospel. And then pretty soon we realized that those six M's don't just apply to the workplace, they apply to any place. You can model godly culture at a party as well as in an office. You can make good work flipping a burger at home and you can make good work flipping a burger in a restaurant. You can minister grace and love at a soccer game and you can minister grace and love when you're firing somebody. You can mold the culture around your kitchen table by putting a candle on it for dinner and you can mold the culture in your team by bringing in Krispy Kreme donuts. You can be a mouthpiece for truth and justice by snuffing the gossip out in a college dorm and you can be a mouthpiece for truth and justice by making sure the right person gets the credit for closing the deal in a bank. And you can be a messenger for the gospel anywhere. Suddenly, people had a framework to help each other see where they were being fruitful. And when you can see where you're being fruitful, then your confidence soars because you can see that God is working through you. And so when we offered churches this fruitfulness framework in DVD form, we found we were solving a problem pastors wanted solving. How do you lay the foundations for everyday discipleship and mission for a whole congregation, including work? How do you help home groups with all kinds of different people in them disciple one another for daily mission, including work? Now, of course, the particular language we've used may not suit you, but we know it works in Australia and in Cape Town and, and in lots of places in the US. The point is to find a language for, for fruitfulness, which enables you to build a whole life disciple making culture in your context. Now, of course, one or two DVD courses backed up with some teaching will not change a church culture overnight or sustain it over the long term. You need a DNA deep cultural change. But as it relates to the mission of God in the workplace, Here's our hunch. The only way to create a sustainable, worker-friendly church is to create a whole life disciple-making church. Now, of course, people in today's workplaces need more than the foundations that a whole life perspective brings. There's still a massive need for deeper material, learning how to read the Bible with workers' eyes, sector-specific thinking, focused training on organizational development and transformation and on evangelism in the workplace, and all the things that so many of you have been working on for so long. But all that wisdom will reach more people and go deeper in their lives and bear more fruit in the rich soil of a whole life disciple making church. So after 30 years thinking about work, I guess I've come to this radical conclusion. Jesus 
was right. <laughs> Disciple making is the key. Work isn't a topic to address, it's a context to disciple people for. So we need disciple-making churches. Churches that help people figure out what the way of Jesus is in their context at this time. Not just convert-making churches, but disciple-making churches. Not just disciple-making for leisure time and church activities, but disciple-making for all of life. And so I guess if we in the marketplace movement need to do all we can to call the church we love back to her disciple-making calling, not just for our sake, but for everyone's. If we do that, work will take care of itself. Seek first to make whole life disciples and all these workers will be added unto you. We've only just begun, but we've been praying that there are some people hearing this today who will take it up and take it on. For the liberation of all those Thelmas who don't know they have a mission field already. For the empowering of all those workers who don't know how fruitful they've already been and how fruitful they could be with Christ. For the blessing of the nations and indeed, if I may say so, for the blessing of this nation and the salvation of millions. May it be so in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.